Trading Nut, episode 190. When you are trading and you start off with a losing trade or two losing trades, your mind will have a tendency to fight the pain that has been associated with these losses. And as a result of it, it wants to get back to an emotional equilibrium where the pain has subsided. And that will subside that moment where you're able to claw back what you have just lost. But actually, that's not the best frame of mind to start from. As I'm sure if you, are, if you trade, you will know that, well, then you'll have a tendency just to cut that profit, the next, the next trade that makes a profit, to where, well, at least I'm break even for the day. But that's hardly the, we don't play to break even. We don't even play to win or lose. We, just, we, we, we play to trade the process as opposed to the outcome. The market's going to do something. Your job is not to fight it. The market never, ever runs away. It's always there. That personal diary of trading will make you a much better trader than... I could be right about the direction, but wrong about the trade. Don't focus on the monetary side. Trying to make too much money on a trade is what I have seen killed every trader. Your losses offer you some of the greatest insight you can find into your mistakes. Relax. Learn the process. Candlestick pattern trading is a freaking trap. Don't be in a rush to become a millionaire. Let the market tell you what the market wants to tell you. This podcast is not financial, trading, or investing advice of any kind. What's up, traders? Welcome to another installment of the Trading Up Podcast. I'm your host, Cam Hawkins, and today we've got Tom Hugard on. Now, Tom goes by Trader Tom out there on the internet. He runs a Telegram group of like 15,000 people and trades live daily. Very, very transparent, uh, high stakes, seven-figure trader. Now, we get to hear his, not just whole story, but essentially it's the cheat codes to trading profitably today now it's on the back of a book that he's just released called best loser wins i've read it twice now and i've got to say even the second time through i picked up so much more than the first time so we're going to get into a lot of that and some of the detail around what's in the book through here uh, in here in the next couple of hours now I say couple of hours because this is a part one of a two-part interview it stretched <laughs> it was the longest interview I've had on the channel but it's full of golden nuggets in here guys so you're probably going to want to listen to this or watch this every um, few weeks to get your head around everything that Tom is telling us here now we also did do a third recording where he breaks down trading with like on a high stake account so that's uh, coming out as well with this show. So guys, it's going to be dropped across the next three weeks. So please, uh, make sure you do subscribe so you don't miss out on any of this great content. That's gonna I'm sure it's going to help your trading, right? So uh, other things before we jump in here. So City Traders Imperium, my sponsors, uh, are running a trading challenge where they're looking for the best traders out there. So if you've passed other funding challenges, if you've got proof of when, you know, when you've won a trading competition or uh, anything like that then you have a chance to get into this trading comp so it's the world funders traders world cup 2022 uh, there's a link below the video to register and the prize is up to 400k as well so guys go and check that out after this now the other thing i want to let you in on is something different here i'm doing on my robot builders club so part of that i have a robot lab where I build trading robots out. Now, I'm going to launch something called Robot Lab Live. It's a game changer. It's a bit like what I did a few months ago, which was Algo Fund the Mastermind. It's a bit like that, but over a longer period of time. And I think you're going to get more uh, value in it if you're looking to semi-automate or fully automate any of your trading strategies. So there's going to be more detail up on the website. I'll put a link under the video for this as well and in the podcast description or just head over to tradingnut.com and find that robots link in the top nav. All right, enough from me. This episode's so long and so epic, I want to get on with it straight away. So let's do it. After hundreds of interviews, I've worked out that on average it takes about five years to become a profitable trader. But what if there's a way you could get there in one? Well, my sponsor, City Traders Imperium, understands that 95% of your battle is down to mindset. So they created a mindset program called Build Your Edge. Within two months, you'll have the skills and knowledge to become consistent enough to help you pass any funded trader program. To find out more, click the link in the description below or the card above. 
All right, folks, uh, we've got Tom Hugard here on the show. Now, he is the author of a newly released book called Best Loser Wins, uh, which I've just listened to in the last two days. And I almost finished it, Tom. I was 24 minutes away from finishing it before I had to set up for this. So I almost got there, but it was it was really, it was actually pretty transformational for me. Um, but first of all, yeah, welcome to the show. Thank you. Um, so Tom's over there uh, in Spain on holiday, uh, relaxing there. Uh, he's been uh, at City Index as a broker for 12 years, worked at JP Morgan, is now a home trader, and probably, I'd say, I'd probably be fair to say that you're probably the most transparent trader by far out there on the internet. You share literally everything with your audience. I've been in your Telegram group for probably a, at least a year and a half now, not religiously, but I've definitely seen what you've been doing, uh, and you definitely have a good solid sound uh, background and view on the mental side of, of trading uh, and yeah do it in real time with your audience which is fantastic so today we're going to probably have a bit more of a different kind of show than what I normally do and dive heavily into some of the mindset related stuff around what you do Tom so um, yeah thanks for coming on and I'm just going to quickly go through how we're going to break down the show which is, is going to help the listeners understand the format so just, we're going to start off with getting into your own transformation. Uh, then we're going to dive into how you've helped sort of other traders or advice for other traders. And then uh, how you trade these days, so detail around that. Uh, uh, then we're going to talk a little bit about the book, coaching, mentoring, and then we're going to end with a dad joke because I appear that you like dad jokes. So <laughs> <laughs> that's what we're going to do. Um, right, so to start off with, like, uh, do you want to give, I, I suppose, elaborate a bit more on your background so the guys that don't know you can get more of a, a feel for who you are and where you've come from? Okay, thank you, and thank you for having me on the show. Uh, I think I'd like to start with present time and then uh, and reverse. Um, I am a trader that, through that transformation came to realize that many of us will have a, a, a gap to bridge between what we know and what we are capable of producing. So I don't think that there's a human being on planet Earth that not relatively quickly can acquire a decent skill set uh, to trade the markets, be it fundamental analysis or technical analysis or, or just some, something as plain as reading a trend, a 200-day moving average pointing in a one direction or up or down. But I think the vast majority of people that do trade, and here I differentiate between trading and, and investing, because an investor will have time on his side, and if the investment isn't uh, particularly moving in, in his or her favor, then time has a tendency to catch up with them and 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 the trend will then produce exactly what they the desired outcome they want but the time is not on the side of a of a day trader not by any means and i think the vast majority of people that do day trade they will have a a real struggle with bridging the gap between what they see at the end of the day and what they have actually produced during the day so after the fact, we look at the five-minute chart of the Dow Jones index or the NASDAQ or whatever it is that we are trading, and we are thinking, wow, there are some great opportunities there. Why didn't I sell that double uh, top? Or why didn't I buy that double bottom? Or wow, that was a measured move. Or not that I use Fibonacci ratios, but wow, that was a perfect 61% retracement with a double bottom or whatever it may be. Um, patterns galore, we can all see it after the fact. But I think as we, uh, as we sit there during the day, and many day traders will look at a five-minute chart or a 10-minute chart. So let's take the, the five-minute chart. And let's say that you're trading the German DAX index. And it's open from local time, 9 o'clock till about 5.30. So there's something about it. So it's, it's, it's open for about eight, eight and a half hours. And then there's 12 five-minute bars in every single hour. So that means that we're talking about there's about 96 to 100 five-minute bars that you are watching. And, and, and I, I say to people that there will be an amazing opportunity or two or three every single day. The problem that we have, as, as traders have is that we have a, a mind that is essentially a problem-solving mind. And if there is no problem to solve, it will sure shit 
create a problem for you because it doesn't like to be idle. The, the whole uh, ethos around uh, mindfulness, meditation, uh, sitting in a, in a monastery is to quiet this monster at the, at the top of your shoulder. And very few people are, are truly aware of the implication of the mind when they go into trade trading. And why should they? Because when you sign up with a brokerage, what, what will the broker give you? Well, they'll give you chart analysis. They will give you tools. They'll give you literature, or many brokers will give you literature, but it's all centered around technical analysis. So we are led to believe that the people that are offering the product, well, they will also have the solution to how to navigate this thing called the financial market. And so what we do is we spend a disproportionate amount of time just learning the tools. You, you, you learn about, say, let's take an analogy, you are, you are a Formula One race driver. And you think, well, all I need to do is I need to have the fastest car possible. But if you don't know how to curtail your own, your own mind, your fears, your, your greed, your optimism, your recklessness, well, then the best car in the world won't do you much good. A, a film that I was particularly fascinated by was the, the, uh, the, 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 the combative relationship between a, a race driver of past called Nicky Lauda and, a, and, a, and an English driver called, I think it was James Hunt. And in this movie that describes their, their rather symbiotic, uh, <laughs> uh, what do you call that, um, a, a not companionship, but a competitive spirit, there is a scene where uh, the, the English driver, James Hunt, he's lying on the floor with his eyes closed, and he's basically just he's driving the course. And he is, he is visualizing all the nuances of the particular race he's about to engage in, in the following days. And I, and, I, and I draw inspiration from that scene because I, I think uh, it's so important for me, at least here, to say to, to people that are listening to this, that I, I don't go into a trading session uh, just knowing where support and resistance is. I also go in and I have spent equal amount of time, if not a lot more time, on preparing my mind on all the things that will throw at me in order to, uh, it wants to be nursed and entertained and engaged. And when you have a hundred five-minute bars where you're sitting and you patiently wait for, you need something to counter that. So as, as I started with this long-winded answer, and I'm sorry, but I do have a tendency to rattle on, is that when I started some 20-odd years ago, and I worked for J.P. Morgan, which wasn't a trading job, but I sat right next to a Bloomberg terminal. And, and, I, and I thought to myself, well, in order to succeed at this game, Cam, you, you just need information. You just need to know about, you know, what analysts are recommending, what are they saying, where they live, and all of these things. And, I write, and the reason why I wrote this book was, I don't, I don't know if you, you or, or your audience have, uh, have, have, have read the, the chapter that I, I wrote. And then unfortunately, it didn't make its way into the book because I wrote it too late and there was a deadline. But I actually wrote a story about how it came to be that I wrote Best Loser Wins. And I don't know if, you, and I'm not trying yeah. to put you on the spot, but did you manage to read I that? I did read that, yeah, yeah. And funnily enough, I think that was like a big aha moment for me, what you actually mentioned in that. And, I, and uh, you go on, because I'll tell you afterwards why, why I, it was a big aha moment for me. Well, why don't I just try and sum it up very quickly? Um, I left, as you said, City Index after 10 years on a, on a trading floor, and I started trading for myself. And I was well-funded. Um, I had spent uh, very little over my 10 years and had earned good bonuses and I'd studied technical analysis. I'd traded for myself. I traded on the behalf of the company, managing their risk. And I thought, well, look, if I'm not qualified, <laughs> no one is qualified. No, I, I, I was able to do what almost nobody is, is, is able to do, spend 10 years sitting watching practically every tick in the market from 7 a.m. till 9 p.m. 
Give talks about it. Um, I gave seminars for Barclays Bank clients, TD, TD Waterhouse, Price Waterhouse, uh, Nat West, Hargreaves, Lansdowne, all these credentials. And then when it came to it, I thought, well, hang on. Yeah, sure, I can make a living. But there, there's a cost to this living, Cam, and this thing. But you're very alone. You don't have any social engagement anymore. And I thought, well, that to me was a, somewhat of a sacrifice. And I thought I would make more. You know, I was on about £100,000 a year when I, at, at its peak eh, when I worked at City Index. And I thought, well, I should be at least be able to replicate that. That's £400 a day. I mean, surely when you're trading uh, 50 pounds a point or whatever I was trading, I can make, I can make, I can make eight points a day. It's like eight points. Have you seen how much the market will give you every single day? And so, and yet I found that I wasn't able to replicate the, the expectations I had. I wasn't able to bridge that gap. And so what the whole book, sorry, the, the, that chapter that unfortunately didn't make it into the book is that, I kind of went on a bit of a spiritual journey in the sense that I took some time out to think, what's going on? And as, as this chapter then describes, which of course is, is you, know, you can download it free of charge. It's not, a, it's not a sales pitch for anything that you must go and get this chapter called How Best Loser Wins Came yeah. About. <laughs> is that, that the reality is that I needed to actually do a lot more mental preparation. Mental preparation in, in attempting to still that mind. And I'll, I'll, I'll give you a practical example is that when you are trading and you start off with a losing trade or two losing trades, your mind will have a tendency to fight the pain that has been associated with these losses. And as a result of it, it wants to get back to an emotional equilibrium where the pain has subsided. And that will subside that moment where you're able to claw back what you have just lost. But actually, that's not the best frame of mind to start from. As I'm sure if you, are, if you trade, you will know that, well, then you'll have a tendency just to cut that profit, the next, the next trade, the next mm-hmm. profit, to where, well, at least I'm break even for the day. But that's hardly the... We don't play to break even. We don't even play to win or lose. We just we, we, we play to trade the process as opposed to the outcome. And I happened to meet a, a gentleman on the journey, uh, on this spiritual journey, as I call it, but it was essentially just a, a walk up in the mountains in North Spain. And uh, he had happened to have gone through the, the Navy SEAL training in America. And at the, that point, I wasn't particularly fascinated with combat soldiers and, and specialist forces, but I came afterwards because walking with him uh, for the weeks that I did was immensely enlightening into the human psyche. And when I came back home, uh, I, I started a very different approach to my trading that that was actually almost predominantly focused on how I was thinking during the day and making it into a sport to be patient and not chase down everything that I saw on a screen, but be very selective. But then when I was selective, be overly aggressive. There's a really good scene in that um, series called Billions with uh, Bobby Axelrod, and he's, and whoever wrote that, they really must have had a great insight into the into trainers' mindset because, in this scene, which is set on a race course, late, late, late in the evening, it's dark. There's no one there but Bobby Axelrod and his, I believe it's his lawyer, saying, "You know why? How I got started? I got started out here in the race course, and I saw all these punters just." run to the booth and betting on Thin Lizzy at 3 o'clock or, or Slim Malloy at 5 o'clock. And then when they lost, they tore up their tickets in disgust and, 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 and left the race course. And I said, that's not going to be me. So I started learning from the people who actually did make money. And what I realized was that they bet 
late and they bet big. And to me, I translate that as you're patient, so you don't rush in, you're patient, and then when you feel that you have got something, you bet big. So you bet late and you bet big. And little snippets like that throughout the years have reinforced the behavior that, that I do is that when I trade and I see something, I bet big. And then I try to do everything that nobody else does. You know, I don't take part profits. Instead, I double up and I double up because I, when I am right, I want to be right a lot more than when I'm wrong. And so this behavior, we'll, we'll get to it, Cam. I'm sorry. We will we'll get no, to it. No, this is good, I, mate. This is then, good. Carry on. And, and, and so, and so it, then as charts would happen was that I, um, I was invited by a brokerage called ETX Capital. I believe they're called Oval now, Oval X. Well, you know what it is. Brands transform and, uh, and, and change. But ETX Capital, as it was known, they asked me if I wanted to give training to their new, newly established Danish office. And, and of course, I said, yeah, yeah I, I, I would love to do that because I thought it also gets me out of the office, which is something that you don't get much of. It wasn't like I was paid anything for it. It was just like an opportunity to go and talk. And so I developed a training program, but it wasn't just technical analysis. There was an overt focus on mental analysis. And I want to tell you a little side story, if you don't mind. Most of your viewers or listeners will have read the book called Market Wizards. And I'm sure you will have come across Market Wizards as well. Well, one of the, uh, to me, one of the notorieties in Market Wizards is a gentleman called Ed Sakota. Now, there's a story about Ed Sakota that very few people actually know. And I'm not quite sure how I got to have heard about this. But the story goes that Ed Sikoda was invited by a university to give a semester course on commodity speculation. And this, this took place over 12 modules or 12 weeks. And so um, Ed Sikoda goes into the lecture room and it's, you know, it's, it's, it's a well-packed room. And he says to, to, to the students, right, over the 12 weeks, I'm going to teach you about commodity trading and following trend, et cetera, et cetera. So for the first lesson, we're going to teach you the technicals. And for the second lesson, I'm going to teach you the lesson. And for the next 10 lessons, I'm going to teach you what to do when you want to do something else. And, and let me just reemphasize here that Ed Sakota, with his amazing insight into yeah. the human mind, said, I need two lessons to teach you the technicals, and I need 10 lessons to teach <laughs> the mind. Yeah. And to me, that's like a... Boom! Uh, insight into yeah. one of the most phenomenal uh, commodity traders that the world had ever seen in terms of returns. It's like, well, yeah, it's so easy to teach the, 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 the technicals, but hey, get to the bottom of how to deal with this thing here yeah. because that's going to do everything you don't want to do. It's, it's not going to want to take the loss when you should take the loss. It, it wants to take profit when you shouldn't take profit. And so I started teaching the ETX Capital clients about this whole concept of what we need to fight. And one of the, the, the doctrines that I invented, which I'm sure you must have heard, is that you know most people um, uh, most become most people are fearful when they should be hopeful. Yeah. Most people are hopeful when they should be fearful. And what that yeah. means is that you're hoping when actually you should be fearing that that losing trade you have gets a lot worse. So instead of of, of instead of fearing that it's going to get worse, they're hoping it's going to get better. And, and vice versa, when you are in a profitable trading, you're fearful that your profits are going to disappear. When in reality, you need to train your mind is, hey, I should be hopeful that it's going to get even better. And these were the concepts that I started teaching. And then as charts would have it, I was at a Christmas party at ETX Capital a couple of years later, and I was invited into the CEO office. His name was Andrew Edwards. And Andrew Edwards, and sadly, is, is no longer with us, but he was just such an amazing gentleman and, and so knowledgeable about what clients needed. And he was so happy that he had put me in charge of, of, of creating the educational content for ETX Capital. And he said, see that chart there? Those are the Danish clients. And you see that chart there? Those are the rest of the world. And do you see the equity curve? you see that your 
the, the clients that, that Denmark has are so vastly different in their trading profile than everyone else. And so we looked at what is so special about the Danes. Are they, <laughs> are they, are they happier? Are they healthier? Are they, what's going on? And every single thesis that we tested, we just dismissed. And the only thing that we came to conclude was that it was because they had the right kind of training. And, and that you had trained them to focus as much on the mental aspect of trading as opposed to just, I'm going to use a MACD, RSI, stochastics, and so forth. And that, to me, was just this amazing boost in my work. And that's how Best Loser Wins started becoming mm. a, a, a concept that I worked on. But I never thought I was going to be an author. I'm not an author. I'm a, I'm a trader. And I love trading. And it's also, I don't run a seminar business. I don't, I don't sell anything. I mean, I think this is the first product that I ever created that, that you can actually go and buy, which <laughs> out on Amazon tomorrow on the 16th of August. But all joking aside, I, I certainly didn't write it because I wanted to make a few royalty pennies out of a book. I wrote it because I felt that, that we needed a book in this world that was written by someone that people could visibly go and see traded every single day, hence the Telegram channel, but someone that messes up as much as everyone else does, but is still overall very profitable. That's how, how Best Loser Wins came uh, to, to, be, to, to be a realization. Yeah. It's a, it's a, yeah, so what I was, what I was going to mention, mention on, and like, by the way, it's an awesome introduction to the whole uh, interview we're about to do. But what I was going to touch on was, I think it was that, uh, I, I can't remember because I read a few things, and I think it was that uh, missing chapter. And I think at the end of it even, um, I don't know if it was like you had asked a, cli- a client or one of your Telegram group members who had reached out, you know, you, you say you, you pretty much dismiss all of them, apart from the odd one, and you'll go, okay, well, look, I'll, I'll I'll give you some advice. Um, and then you said to them, what are you doing about it? And then the answer is, well, she, nothing. And it's, there's your problem. You're not doing anything about it. And I was like, that's, that's, that in its own right is an absolute game changer. And I even asked myself that question straight away. I was like, what am I doing about my trading? And I, my answer was, I think, I'm gonna, I think I have to say nothing. I think I have to say nothing. I think the answer is nothing. So straight away, I went away and I put together a whole piece of work, which now basically focuses on the mental aspect of my trading versus all the other stuff that I'd never focused on. So I can now see what you're talking about around the, you know, um, if I'm gonna, if I'm supposed to take three R, why did I, why did I exit that trade with one point two R and not three R? I was supposed to take three. So, it, it, I mean, it, this stuff does work. That, that's all I can say to start off the interview. This stuff does work. So um, let's jump into uh, your own transformation. So when you basically went from a, a, a struggling trader onto a, becoming a consistently profitable trader, I mean, first of all, how did you work out that the battle was internal and not external? How did you come to that realization? That happened up in the mountains, Ed. Talking to this gentleman made me realize that I had been looking the wrong place. And it's no coincidence that the book is called Best Loser Wins. It's a, I think what you, in English, it's called a, a dichotomy. And is it called an oxymoron? The, 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 the two things actually bats up against each other. And it's meant to provoke you. It's meant to provoke you, make you thinking, well, in order to become a good trader, I actually need to learn to lose better. And it, it boils down to, uh, as I see it, and I, I, must, I must emphasize here that I don't have any formal training in how the mind works. I'm not qualified to, uh, to create a diagnostic of, of people's well-being, their mental well-being. But I can analyze myself and I can analyze my own behavior. And so the best loser of win uh, focus on me getting better at losing without it causing unnecessary disturbance to my mental well-being. So what the gentleman in, in Spain, the, the American Hollywood producer, he was quite a character. Jesus, he was a character. Uh, like one of those larger-than-life characters. But what he made me uh, focus on, what he, 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 what he told me specifically to do is, 
you have got to analyze your performance. You have actually got to look at it and almost relive it. And I think right there is a, a, an, a behavior that very few people will engage in. Very few people will take a trade. I, I like to learn visually. I, I learn best. So if you, if you teach me how to, I don't know, dismantle a piece of equipment, I actually need to see you do it as opposed to perhaps reading about it or, or hearing about it. I, I, I need you to do the bolts. And, the, mm-hmm. and, and, and what this gentleman made me do is he almost made me defragment my own trading. So I saw the chart as I saw it when I executed the trade. And then I saw the chart after the facts. And, okay, so this is what happened. And you took your profit there or you didn't take your loss there. And, and so you would have almost like a, no, no, almost you would have a before shot and an after shot. And I call this the, I, I had given it different names, but one part of my warm up aspect every morning when I uh, prepare for the market open is that I go through what I call the book of horror. And it's this ginormous PowerPoint presentation. That's, it's not a piece of software. It's, it's almost like handwritten, but it's, a, it's essentially a PowerPoint presentation, presentation where I have all my old trades. And the, the, the marvel of it is that you can remember, once you have that visual cue, you can actually remember trades that took place months and months ago, especially if they hurt you. And what I want to do is I want to relive the good moments and the bad moments so that I know, so I'm actually preparing my, my mind to what is it I want to avoid today and what is it, what mechanism, what behavior is it that I want to accentuate today so that uh, for, for me, probably the be all end all is the trade selection. The, the, the patience to wait for the right moment and when the right moment then gets there, you, you hit it hard and then you live with the consequences. And, and to me, that makes the difference between making a okay income to making an outstanding income. And then the, the whole element of doing it on live on Telegram is I, I've analyzed the my behavior in putting my trades out on telegram. And I've asked myself some brutal questions. Are you doing it for glory? Are you doing it for ego? Uh, Or are you, uh, are you this altruistic human being that just likes to the benevolent soul? And, and then, and then I thought to myself, there is actually a, a third solution. That is I'm accountable to someone. You see one thing that we, uh, retail traders don't have that bank traders have is that they will have a compliance officer that will overlook their positions and overlook them over their shoulders all the time. Cam, you have to be everything. You have to be the trader. You have to be the analyst. You have to also be the, 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 the vigilant mind that observes your own behavior. That's a tall order for most people to be Cam, Are you tired today? Well, it's not me who's saying it. It is, Cam asks Cam, yeah. "Hey, mate, are you are you really sure you want to risk your capital today?" And and all of these things is an integral part of being a successful trader. But it's unfortunately something that will require taking you away from the charts and looking inwards and be still and really truly listening to well, what's going on. And I don't think many people are prepared to do that. It's At it's- least not until they. Perhaps someone like me who then goes, look at the difference between what it used to be. Mm. I mean, it's no, it's no secret what I do because I put my account up there. I put my performance up there. And so everyone can see, and, and it's all done real time. It's, it's time stamped. So people can see for yourself, hell, he did really buy it there. And, and that price that I see, that's actually the price that where the market was at that moment in time. And I'm not doing it because I, I want people to follow me. I think people should follow themselves. But in terms of being a role model and a guidance, that's what really what the Telegram channel is about. So that people have an opportunity to be inspired by someone. But, but from that point of view of what truly matters, because one of the things you have to ask yourself, Cam, in my mind, you have to ask yourself, 
when you wake up in the morning, what will you do that the 90% will not do? Because when you look at all the, the, the broker's front pages, they will have to tell you what percentage of their clients are winning clients and are losing clients. So, Kayam, do you wake up in the morning and go, what am I going to do to avoid being in the 90% cap today? Uh, I, because I, if I, you I try don't to. do that. <laughs> yeah, yeah, well, yes. And what I'm saying is that what we need to initiate as part of our warm-up routine is a lot less focus on, you know, is the market trending upwards or is it trending downwards? People think that's truly important. Mm. It isn't. What's really important is that you have the tools mentally to adjust to whatever the market will throw at you today. Because I'll tell you this, through statistical observation, I have concluded that it doesn't matter if the trend is up or down, bull market or bear market, there's a 50-50 chance that the market will close up today or down today. And it doesn't matter. And this is based on 30,000 observations of of 30 years or 7,500 trading days. So to me, if I had the choice between having one hour of looking over the charts or one hour of mental preparation, meditation, visualization, looking over my old trades. I will at any time of the day, week, month, I'll always take the mental side. I don't care. I could sit down right now not knowing what's happened in the last two weeks and I would still be able to make money as long as I've had my warm-up, my mental warm-up. It's funny, um, when I look at the videos that I put out there, when I put a a mindset video out on the channel, I guarantee that it'll get like 10% of the views of a technical analysis one. That's just the way, I mean, and and that's probably the the whole nature of why there's so many people losing. Can I interrupt you there? Yeah. So what does that tell you? That you get 10% of the views of, say, a chart view, a chart video, but 90% of people lose. There you go. Exactly. Do, not, do you not think, hey, I need to tell you something. It, it's just sprung to my mind. Do you know a guy called Steve Ward? No. Now, well, Steve Ward is a, is a British trading coach, and he's a really good friend of mine. Uh, and I trained with him uh, when I was at City Index. And then our, we sort of passed, just sort of drifted apart, and he did what he did. And then um, I... I'm a big fan of a gentleman called Al Brooks, yeah. and I'm a big fan of a gentleman called Larry Pesavento. And I, I decided to put together an event after COVID. I thought, we'd spent two years in isolation. Let's try and actually meet up with a human being and actually, <laughs> hey, how are you doing? So I, I asked Al Brooks and Larry Pesavento, come to London, and we'll do a symposium, a three-day symposium. We trade live, and... Al, you do your price action. Larry, you do your Fibonacci, your ratios, your pattern recognition, A, B, C, D, all of these things. But I thought we also need something to counter that. And I asked Steve Ward if he would come. He's written three books on, um, uh, on, on the psychology of trading. And so Steve Ward, he's a, he's a very imposing character. He's very, he's big, strong, tall. And so he stands there on the stage and he starts his talk. And he says, hang on one second here. Can I just, by show of hands, ask people, how important do you think psychology is in trading? Uh, and do you want to put a percentage on? And that's, uh, I think it's 30%. I think it's uh, 60%. I actually think that it's 80%. And, and people sort of say, and so the consensus was that the, the mental side to trading accounted for about 80% of the, of of your of 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 the overall preparation, in the sense that uh, technical analysis would only take you so far, mm. but it truly is how you think uh, when you are when you are winning and how you think when you're losing that matters. And this was the general consensus. About 150 people there, and then came the bomb. And then he he said, "So if you think that successful trading is men, uh, 80% mental." Why do you spend one percent of your of your time mentally preparing? And there was just this silence that descended over the audience. People went, "Yeah, why do I spend so little time?" When, yeah. by by general consensus, I have just agreed with everyone that 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 real top performing trading is pretty much a mental game. Once you've le- once you've learned the technical setups, mm. it's pretty much a mental game. 
So why am I spending so little time mentally preparing? And I think people walked out from that speech afterwards, and there's this silence at the lunch break. People go, damn, <laughs> damn, I've got this the wrong way around. And to me, I was sitting, I was in the audience while going, I told you. <laughs> but just hearing it from someone else was just tremendously reinforcing. And, and then when you're then saying that, hey, when you put out a psychology video, you get a tenth of the, of the, of the hits of the views. But if someone comes on board and says, uh, I got a video about the Holy Grail, and you're like, oh, my God, you're getting a million views before the, the day is over. Go, oh, I got a, I got a whole message. It's all about technical. But listen, people don't uh, have a deficiency in technical analysis. You don't, you're not a losing trader because you don't know enough about technical analysis. You're a losing trader because you don't understand the mind when you're under pressure. That's the, that's the brutal truth. But unfortunately, being honest with yourself is probably also the rarest of commodity amongst behavioral traits. We delude ourselves into thinking we are something that we're generally not. And so part of my telegram experience is also a, a, an, a, um, an audit process. I read a, an interview with Tom Cruise. And I like Tom Cruise um, because I, I think he is the kind of character he always wants to do his best, and he's turning himself inside out. Now, where I perhaps lose it a little bit with Tom Cruise is when it comes to Scientology. But I say that from an unqualified point of view, having read Dianetics, uh, well, I think it's called Dianetics, but, but then really not knowing any more about it. But one thing I did pick up on was that they have a continuous audit process where they constantly review, well, could I have done better? And being a reviewer of your own life is damn hard work. It's truly hard work to constantly reflect upon yourself. And it is something that the rarest will do. But those that do, they will also be in that category of the high performers. That, that reminds me of something I heard about Sylvester Stallone. He watched a movie, and I think it was Rocky, in the audience. Rocky was in there, and it was like well after Rocky had gone out, and uh, he was watching it for whatever reason. And somebody interviewed him after the show and said, well, you know, what, what do you think? And he's like, well, there was a scene about 10 minutes in where I thought I could have done like the word a bit better, that, word, that particular yes. word there. And it's like he was critiquing himself years later on how, was he, how he performed in that. He didn't care about the movie. He was just critiquing it because that's what they do. It's, it's, it's classic. Um, okay, and, well, and, 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 and don't you think that that's a trait that people that are successful have that people that are not successful? Not that you can't be successful, but the bar is quite low in professional world. Well, you come to work, you know, and you can sort of hide in the group and there's an office landscape. But truly being in the pinnacle, being a producer of Rocky, mm. I read that he had written that movie at when he was absolutely down and out and participated in movies that no one should really be participating in All and right. <laughs> just real it's like down and out and he produces his best work. To me, Hearing you telling that story, it, it just cements the spending quality time every single day reviewing what it is you're doing, whether it's being a parent or being a co-worker or being a husband or a, a, a wife or a girlfriend or boyfriend. Or what are you bringing to the game? And I, I credit my trading success with that review process, that constant review process. Mm. And it can, I'll tell you this, it's hard work. There is no doubt about it. It could have been an easier life. Yeah. It's interesting because uh, it's funny. When I was reading, when I was listening to your book in the last couple of days, I was thinking one of the things because it was like uh, that came out to me was avoid, avoid pain. People avoid pain at all costs. And when I was thinking about all the other self-help books I'd read, like they might give you seven things to do and one of them was like really easy for me to do and the other six were really hard and I'd be like, I'll just do the one that's easy. I'll just do that. All I need to do is make this little tweak and I can do it. And all the other six I'd just completely discount but those were the ones that were important and I knew that they'd come with pain. So I'd do anything to avoid that kind of pain. Um, now what I want to do is dive into the, 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 I suppose when you made that transition across from struggling to consistent 
and you went through that whole process. I mean, I, I know it was a while ago, but ca- are you able to sort of bring people to that point of journaling, seeing the change, journaling, seeing the change, you know, making, checking the PowerPoints, seeing the change? How did that all unfold for you? Uh, that's, that's a good question. Um, I, I need to tell a little side story because I think it's relevant to what we just spoke about. Um, I attended a, a Tony Robbins workshop, one of those uh, three-day, monster long days with a lot of rah, rah, I am the voice, I am the power, blah, blah, blah. And at some point during day one, six hours in, I took a look around and I'm thinking, what the fuck am I doing here? Because the, the, it, because I had this epiphany that the mind rewarded us for the wrong thing. We got this ick, 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 exhilarant feeling of an accomplishment just because we promised ourselves that we were going to start exercising and eating better and da di da di da And I had, at that moment, I realized, well, the hard work is yet to begun. And I'm already celebrating. And I, and, I, and, I, and I thought very deeply about it in the days and the weeks to come is that you, 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 you have to fall in love with the process as opposed to feeling rewarded just because you decided, I'm going to start spending time on mental analysis or I'm going to, I'm going to lose weight on Monday or I'm going to stop drinking or smoking. Because the, the mind has this tendency going, well done, Cam. You're going to stop boozing now. That's brilliant. Now, when can we have that next drink? Because I've already rewarded you now. You, you got the reward. You, you thought to yourself, I'm going to better my life. But actually, that's not the cause for celebration. The, 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 it, that's just cause for, okay, how do, I, how do I focus on the process as opposed to the outcome? And I thought Tony Robbins was all about outcome-orientated, outcome-orientated. And I might gain a few, I might gain a few enemies from, from saying this, but I felt... There was not enough focus or any focus on, hey, what are you going to do when you're not doing the very thing that you promised yourself you would do? What are you going to Mm. do? What mechanisms are you going to put in place so that when you come to that point where everyone else falls off the cliff or falls off the wagon or or reaches out for that chocolate bar when you're on a diet, what are you going to do to get yourself back on track because that's where most people just go it's like third it's the third day of the new year i i I estimate that all the all those grand wishes of new year resolutions they're gone because we haven't actually truly thought out the process we just said hey from new year i'm going to stop smoking drinking or whatever eating chocolate and and the, then the brain, in that moment you utter those words, the, the brain rewards you and you feel good already. But that's not the right time to feel good. That's the wrong time. And so when you, you ask me, what did I do? I said, well, I created a process. And, and, and it's not a, I'm actually at this very moment where you and I are having this dialogue. I know I'm supposed to be on holiday, but when I'm on holiday, I, I, I get very inspired. And I'm, I'm, I'm beginning to write an article quite far in, and it's called How to Increase Your Trading Size. And part of the uh, increasing your trading size is you need to be confident. You need to have a process in place. And in there, I describe, well, what did I do in order to increase my trading size? And to be specific with you, what I did um, when I came back from the, uh, my mountain religious experience with a Hollywood uh, ex-Navy SEAL was I began, first of all, I, I printed out all my trades for the last year. And then I thought, okay, there's a big bulk in the middle that are, you know, decent trades. And, I, and then there's a, the, some good winners and there's some shitty losers. Let's start with the crappy losers. Let's analyze them. Let's put them down on paper and review them saying, what were you thinking? You shorted, fine, so you shorted the market. But then the next bar and the next bar and the next bar closed higher and higher and higher. And you move the stop loss. What exactly were you thinking, and what could you learn from that? And so now that you had this process, uh, sorry, you had this work done. And and by the way, that wasn't that didn't take two hours. That was easily three or four weeks worth mm. of consistent work, charting all your old trades, putting them down, 
and creating the narrative around it. Well, what can you learn from here? What were your what were your Achilles heel here? And then I looked at my winning traits, and you're thinking, well, why would you look at your winning traits? Well, because very often I came to realize that I had a tendency to, I would say I would buy something into an uptrend. Okay, I bought, say I bought the DAX at 30, and then it got to 50 or 60. I'm thinking, wow, fantastic. How great am I? But let me just take half profit. Let me just take some off because, hey, you can't go broke taking a profit. And if I take half here, I will have nullified the loss that I had over here. So you create this mental accounting, which is a very false narrative. And so looking over my winning trades, I'm thinking, wow, what if I had added instead of taking profit? What if I had done exactly the opposite of what I really felt like doing? What if I had bought at 30 and then when it went up to 60, instead of taking half profit, what if I had moved my stop loss to break even on the 30 position and now doubled up on my position or added 25% to the position? How would that have looked? And I began to create a, a storybook that made me realize that although I probably wouldn't win more often by doing it this way, when I did win, I would tenfold my profit. So this work, and I'm, I'm really, really adamant that your, your, your listeners pay attention to this. I didn't increase my, my profit ratio. I didn't begin to win on more trades. But what I did do was I began to make a lot more money on the trade that I did win on. And that, to me, made all the difference. Does, it, does that make sense? Karen? Yeah, that makes sense. That, that makes that, sense. That I, wasn't trying to, I, I wasn't trying to be, oh, 90% of all my trades are winning trades. Well, it would be nice if 90% of my mm-hmm. trades were winning trades. But, but how much am I then losing on the losing trades? What, what, that was what mattered to me. And so this process, which started about oh, eight, nine years ago, is something that I do every single day. But now it's more a question of, well, okay, uh, how are you thinking? Are you, are you tuned in? Are you at, have you slept well? Have you ate well? Is your blood sugar completely even? Have you exercised? Are you truly, are you prepared as if you would be prepared for the final exam in your final degree course of the, 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 the greatest professional uh, qualification you have ever taken, are you that prepared for this trading day? And that's what I attempt to be at every single day. But hey, Cam, I don't want to portray myself to be a saint here either. Sometimes life just gets in the way. Neighbors have a party and you don't sleep so well. So maybe it's like, oh, maybe, I shouldn't, maybe I shouldn't push it today or Oh, I got a toothache or oh, whatever it may be. Yeah. Of course, I'm a human being like everybody else is. But I guarantee you that right now, as we speak, there are hundreds of thousands of day traders that have gone into the trading session and they have spent zero time on preparing their mind. Oh, they've looked at the charts. They've drawn some, they've looked at some moving averages and drawn some trend lines and like that. And that's fine. But truly, uh, to me, trading follows the Pareto principle that we will make 80 or 90% of our profits on those 20% of the trades or 10% of the trades. And what we really need to be is we need to, we need to have some, proce- some procedures in place so that when shit does hit the fan, that we don't become our own worst enemy. Because when you look at your trading performance, if you sent me your trading performance, I would guarantee you that there will be some stinker trades that will have, if you could somehow taken them out of the equation, your PL will look entirely different. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, yeah. and I don't have stinkers like that anymore because I'm mentally prepared to nip them in the bud. And what did, it, what did it first feel like for you when you were stacking those yeah, very first trades that you were like, right, I'm, I'm you know, going long. And I'm going to add to this position. I mean, how did you? Because that was obviously the, the turning point for you, where it all do you sort mind of if I, flipped. Do you mind if I take a metaphor from a different aspect in life? Go but for just it. to draw a comparison, so it's not all about trading. But Cam, have you ever been a smoker? Oh, 
for like very very short period of time. I I, I didn't right, call so myself you... a smoker, but it was uh, uh okay. my wife did. Well, I was. It was for like yeah maybe three months or something. I I was a smoker and and li- almost like anything in life, if I do something, I have a tendency to really do it in style. And I couldn't stop smoking. I I I, I would make all the resolutions that everyone else come Monday that's it or this is my last cigarette and whatever it be. And sometimes I would even last a, a few days, even a few weeks, but I would always come back to it. Why? Well, because my mind had not completely resolved all the issues that it needed to. And then by chance, I, I came across a, a, a gentleman. Incidentally, it was, uh, it was um, uh, back in the late 90s, I, I met a, a, a journalist who was a heavy smoker, had been a heavy smoker. And he said, and he was walking next to me. And he said, oh, yeah, I used to smoke, but I don't smoke anymore. And, uh, you know, it was really easy. I was like, yeah, fat chance of that. And he said, no, no, truly, uh, there's this gentleman called uh, uh, Alan Carr. And he's written this book called The The Easy Way to Stop Smoking. So I well, that's interesting. And I saw, right, he sold two books. There was The Easy Way to Stop Smoking. And that was about 110 pages. And then there was the only way to stop smoking, which was 270 pages. And I thought, mm, I'm going to go for the heavy edition. <laughs> so I read this book and I thought, this is amazing. And I truly understand, I understood the nature of the addiction. And I, I just want to add something that I didn't just read over a weekend. I slowly digested the book and its message while I was still puffing away. But then as we drew towards the end of the book, the final chapter where you had that, he calls it the final cigarette. Mm. I smoked that final cigarette. And that moment I knew I would never smoke again. I was a changed man. Not because, not because my resolve was bigger than it had before, but because I understood what my mind would do mm. when it wanted to reach. Mm. I said, hang on, you, you're trying to fill a void that isn't there. You, you're, your, the narrative that your brain has produced is a false narrative, but now you have been equipped with the right tools to actually say, I'm free from the get-go. And I was free from the get-go. And now I'm celebrating 25 years as a non-smoker. Not because I used patches or chewing gum, but simply because I understood how my mind worked. Then as chance would have it, I went through a not-so-nice divorce. Not that I think divorces are ever nice at any point anyway for anyone involved in the, in the proceedings. And I started drinking, and I started drinking heavily. And I, I thought, wow, I got a problem. And I, uh, I, I, I promised myself, no more drinking, no more whiskey, no more Jack Daniels and Cola. Um, but there was a tool to numb the pain from the split. Mm. And... And, and, you know, you would last a day or two and then back at it again. And then I joined Alcoholic Anonymous and I saw all these other souls struggling with the same issue that I had. But, but their, their process was to, to hand over your uh, control to a deity. Like we hand over control to God and, and there's a religious aspect to it. And, and one that I don't actually subscribe to for reasons i don't want to get into here not that i don't want to discuss religion with you because i'd love to discuss religion with you at any given time but because i don't think it's it's not appropriate for the setting of the measures that you and i are trying to produce here but simply just uh, suffice to say that aa didn't help me either because i didn't believe that i had a terminal illness i believed that i had a mind uh, illness that i could uh, so that i could that i could uh, i could fix through the right kind of thinking mm. and then by chance I came across a book by a gentleman who's actually famous for producing carrot juice. <laughs> okay, I, I, I'm, I'm, being, I'm not doing him a favor now, but his name is Jason Vale. And Jason Vale is known as the juice master. Right. Now, he will create these fantastic juices. He'd write about them. It's very popular. But very few people know that Jason Vale used to have an alcohol problem. And he wrote a book called Kick the Drink Easily. And what's funny is that Jason Vale used to be a smoker and he studied under Alan Carr as well. And then he wrote the same kind of book, but he wrote about alcohol. And I read that book and going, now I understand why I drink. Mm. And on the 15th of July, 2015, I stopped drinking and I haven't had a drop of alcohol 
for the last seven, eight years. And I'll tell you this, I never say to people, oh yeah, I gave up smoking or I gave up drinking. I say, I quit. And there's a difference in language because giving up implies that you have made a sacrifice. I didn't. I replaced faulty thinking with correct thinking. So this was a long roundabout way of saying, how did I feel when I started trading the right way? I felt brilliant, Cam, because even when I lost, I could see I followed the right kind of process. Yeah. And when I lost, I took it almost like a victory because I could see that the victory it was in the process as opposed to I didn't get vindictive. I didn't chase the market. I didn't uh, get bitter that the market had, had stopped me out. And then the market, you know, that feeling when your stop loss is at 30 and the market goes 29 and then it goes back up again. I'm sure we've all had, but I didn't get vindictive just because I got stopped out. I followed the process and my mind was 100% at peace at all time. And that, my friend, is the most amazing place to be in as a trader because it doesn't matter what the market throws at you. You buy, you add, and then the market goes back down again, whatever it is. doesn't matter because nothing will throw you off course. You will say, oh, today was a losing day, but I didn't lose very much. Okay, so let that be it. Because you know that statistically, you're probably going to lose two days out of five anyway, or one day out of five. I happen to make money most days, but that's just buy to buy. When I have losing days, I go, oh, crap. I, and I'm not one of those, oh, it's okay, I'm totally at peace. I, I get annoyed. Of course I get annoyed. But it's not the, the process of getting annoyed. The process of getting annoyed goes, you just wash your soul clean and go, all right, back at it, follow the process. Mm, yeah. And that was a big difference. Rather than getting this morose, uh, vindictive feeling that the market was out to get you, which is like, hey, I'm at peace with this. Now, let's go and focus on doing all the things that the vast majority of people don't want to do. And was that, I, was, that, was that because you knew that like, you know, a big day was just around the corner and it was only a matter of time? Was that because you had that confidence? Well, look, confidence uh, is, is a topic. Um, I think that's a separate topic um, because I think that if you are following a process and you follow that process religiously, I think the confidence comes in the process as opposed to... Um, have you, have you ever heard of the, the, the concept of called situational confidence, where you, you're confident in certain situations, but you're not so confident oh, in other situations? Yeah. And I think that once you truly understand your vocation, but you also understand your own role in the vocation, you, you become a very different human being. And so my advice to you, to anyone who is perhaps having a, a gap between where they are and what they know that they are capable of is stop trading. Just stop for a second and give, give the, the mental side a much, much serious review and, and, and start finding out what are, what are my mental weaknesses. You, you know, the brokers would be in deep shit in this world if we all stopped trading for a while and we actually reviewed our trades and we began to implement some processes whereby when we are winning, we don't take half profits or quarter profits, but we started adding to our to our trade, you know you're a good trader when you add to a winning position. Do you know why? I'll tell you why. Because I spent 10 years on the trading floor. Okay, that's a slight exaggeration. Nine years on the trading floor in a few months. And over those nearly 10 years, I witnessed close to 100 million trades. And I can, I can guarantee you that out of those million trades, many of them were adding to a losing trade. And there was perhaps a handful or 10 or 15 of those tens of thousands of traders that I witnessed over those 10 years, perhaps 10 or 15 of those traders added to the winning positions. So what does that tell you? And, and, and this, is, this, is, this is not me creating a narrative that you should trade more. I think you should trade more selectively. But when you are winning, you need to ask yourself, uh, uh, there's a story that, that just springs to mind, and I have to tell you, because it's all about creating pathways in your mind, Cam, and, and in your listeners' mind, so that they get context. We need to be contextual about it. There's a gentleman who worked for a brokerage called FXCM. Uh, his name was Rodriguez. And Rodriguez thought to himself, why are, our, why are our clients 
Why do they win more often than they lose? Why do all our clients, why, why are most of our clients net, net losers, yet they win more often than they lose? And so he, I think he, he took 43 million trades executed by 25,000 of their active clients over a 15-month period. And it was all in FX pairs. And he found that the winning ratio in, in I think it was in euro dollar, for example, the, 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 winning, the, the winning ratio was about 66%. The problem here was that the average winning trade was 43 pips, but the average losing trade was 83 pips. And so he, he said to himself, well, well, hang on, what's going on here? B -b because surely th there's something wrong with the way that we think if 67% if of all our trades are winning trades, and yet, net, net, we are losing. Being a tap by a bee here. <laughs> and, 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 and to me, if people would actually not just read that piece of statistic and go, oh, that's them, but actually truly begin to appreciate, no, no, that's the human condition. Our minds will flee pain. And when you analyze the, the narrative behind 60 Seven percent are winners and thirty-three percent are losers. But you would lose more on the losing trades than you would do on the winning trades. What's going on? What's the human condition that dictates that narrative? Well, the answer is pretty simple: is that when you're winning, you're snapping at your profits because your mind is afraid that the profit will disappear. But when you're losing, you're hoping that the market will bring you back to equilibrium. So the, the first instance the mind will take the profit to avoid the pain of the profits disappearing. Mm. And secondly, when you're losing, the mind will want you to not take your loss because when you take the loss, the pain will crystallize. And there's a, there's a saying, hope dies last. Do you now begin to see how important it is that we need to shift, we almost need to turn our mental approach to trading upside down? And I don't think that people are doing that mm. at all. And that's why when you look at brokers' front pages, they will say 70% of all our clients are losing or 80% of all our clients are losing. Well, the answer to that is, well, most likely because people are actually just really crap at facing the pain whenever they are confronted with a losing trade. Yeah, it's funny. I, I'd heard that um, many, many years ago, and I can't remember who told me it, around that the hope that the trade will run and that's where you need, your hope needs to be versus the, the fear of the loss. Um, now, now, I want to ask a question around the stacking of, of orders on winning trades. So um, Peter, who helped me get this interview, uh, who's in your Telegram chat, said that you, you now increase or you now increase the position size on winning trades. So say your first position would be, let's say, 10 lots. For example, and your second one might be 15. I mean, how did you get to that point? And what was the genesis and thinking around getting to that point and even doing that? So I... When I began to uh, increase my trading size through my confidence, I thought, how big can I get? I, I began to think, well, hang on, I'm, I'm averaging. Uh, I, I need to be specific here. I'm, I'm averaging, uh, I'm, I'm trading 25 pounds a point, and I'm, I'm averaging a good 2,000 pounds a day. Well, would that then mean that if I was trading 250 pounds a point, but I make 20,000 pounds a day. And what's stopping me from trading 250 pounds a point? Can I do it? And the answer is, yeah, you can. If you begin to imagine it, because I began to draw comparisons from uh, many different facets in life. And I've already spoken um, to you about it when I drew in the analogy of, of Nikki Lauda and, and James Hunt. And he, he was closing his eyes and he's saying, wow, he's driving a race course. Well, I would close my eyes and go, I'm imagining I'm trading 200 pounds a point. And I'm buying another 200 here. And I began to see the chart of the day. And, and I'm, I'm visualizing. And when you, um, Ken, let me ask you a question. Do you have children? Yeah. Okay, fine. In this world, we need to be careful. But, but yeah. imagine one of those children got into trouble. Imagine, close your eyes, 
and imagine that your child has ventured out on a frozen lake and you're standing on the shore and all of a sudden you see your boy or your girl drop through the ice. No one is going to tell me that you can't feel emotions as if they were real Mm -hmm. if you give the right kind of practice, if you create the right kind of mental image. You can sure shit relive that Mm -hmm. as if your child was out there on that ice and that panicky feeling, the things that you truly care about in life, which are family, our children, our our, 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 the the things that are creating the 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 things that are different. You know, you remember that movie? You know, you know, if there was a fire, what would you rescue? I fucking wouldn't rescue my laptop, would I? I'd rescue my children, (laughs) my my my, the the things that mattered. Those are the things that matter. And and I can I can use my mind and I can recreate that. I can I can make you relive your worst nightmare just by imagining that your child falls through there and you go what? now imagine using it for good imagine that you are trading but you're not trading but you're just imagining it and going hey i'm adding oh and then you get that sensation of oh you oh my god i want to take my profit but you stay with that pain because that's your mind thinking this is real and you're staying with the pain so you have you desensitize your mind to the normal impulses. Mm. And that's what the Navy SEAL guy taught me to do. So you know, 10 years ago, I'm walking up in the mountains in 40 degrees in heat. And he said, you got to re, you got to revisit. You got to, and that's what we did in the Navy SEAL. They forced us to repeat the things we weren't good at over and over. So it becomes second nature. And what you need to do is you need to relive those trades over and over but you create a positive outcome. You know, you got fearful and you didn't take your, you, you didn't take your loss. Imagine you're taking your loss and imagine how you'd feel afterwards. Now, you tell me, what do you think has got most clickbait views here? Me talking about closing your eyes or someone coming on board and promising you to show you the perfect stochastic indicator. I know what's going to get most clicks, yeah. but I also know what will make most money. Yeah, yeah, well that's that's the key thing, isn't it? That is the thing. Yeah, and um, that's how brokers make their living these days, Cam. They make their living because through not hedging our trades, because they know that that over time people will just blow up mm. because they can't take losses. Why? Well, because from a DNA, if you, if an evolutionary point of view, and that's what the, the whole everything I'm talking about right now is what best loser wins. And that's not a sales pitch. Buy it, don't buy it. Download it, eat legal copy. Couldn't give a flying hoot. I think I make a pound or two per... It's, I didn't write that book for the royalties. I yeah. wrote that because I felt the world needed a book that actually gave us a recipe to how we can excel in trading so that we actually become profitable traders. And it's not technical. It's not more technical analysis we need. It's not more indicators or ratios or averages or whatever it may be no we need to spend much more time in mental preparation so that when we are faced with difficulties where we you know when we are in the shits and the market is going against us that we can flip that switch without any kind of mental repercussions because we have desensitized our pain thresholds no i've just taken the loss big deal move on All right, folks, there you have it, part one of this two-part interview done. Uh, The next part will be dropping not next week, but the week after. And if you're watching this in the future, there will be a suggested video popping up here if you're on the YouTube channel that you can click on. Um, If you're in the podcast, just wait, and it will drop soon. Now, we did a third video with Tom as well where he breaks down trading on a large account with large lot sizes and that sort of thing. So, guys, that's another epic little video that we shot here and goes for about 20 odd minutes as well uh, so that's dropping so yeah just hit subscribe on this channel and make sure you get access to this great content now before i leave you guys here uh, last but not least remember robot lab live is a new thing for trading up to check it out your best place to go is tradingup.com and click on the robots link in the top and you'll find out more about that when it drops all right folks thanks for watching thanks for listening and we'll see you in the next one
Hey folks, you ever wonder what broker I use? Well, I use Hanko Trade. It was a no-brainer because I was looking for a broker with good trading conditions and one that wouldn't restrict my leverage. Now, by joining Hanko Trade, I've also cut down my trading costs significantly with their super low commission of just $1 per 100K. You can learn more at hankotrade.com or just click the link I've put in the description.